Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our talk tonight. Um, um, my name is Amber. I'm the president of the Wit Students Pathology Society. Um, we are very excited to be hosting um, two HIV lectures this week, um, with our first one being tonight on um, the current and future options of PrEP. So thank you to all our committee members, to our um, other Wit students for joining, and all so a big thank you to our doctor, sorry, actually our prof, who is presenting to, to us today. Um, so let me just quickly read a short bio about her and then we can begin. So today we have um, Sinead Delani, who um, is a researcher at the WITS RHI and also a research professor at our very own WITS Health Science campus. Um, her research interests span between sexual and reproductive health and infectious diseases, specifically in adolescent girls and young women. Um, Dr. Delani has worked on several um, phase three HIV trials um, in different prevention technologies. Um, she studied a lot um, in oral PrEP as well as topical and most recently injectable PrEP. Um, she's currently an investigator on two studies um, evaluating new treatment options and vaccines for gonorrhea. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today, Prof. We're really looking forward to hear what you have to say. Um, so we'll have about a, um, a talk, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, and then the floor will be open to anyone who has questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Amber, for the introduction. I'm just going to share my slides. So let's hope this works. And um, is that coming through okay? Yes, that's perfect. Are you seeing uh, the, the full screen or the notes page? The full screen. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, PrEP current and future options. And uh, just want to thank you very much for the, the opportunity to to talk with you about something that has been um, a part of my life for 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 several years. So the first thing I wanted to do, because I wasn't sure, you know, kind of how familiar everyone is with PrEP, is really just to talk about why we need prevention agents. And so if you look on the UNAIDS website, um, the reports for 2022 suggest that 4,000 people are infected with HIV every day. And what we saw when UNAIDS released their report in July of 2022 is in fact uh, reductions in, in HIV incidents were the smallest that they have been for many years. If you look on the graph, there is a downward trend in incidents, but that is the target for 2025. And we're going to need a very steep trajectory to get to reach that target. Uh, and observations are that COVID has disrupted HIV programs around the world such that in sub-Saharan Africa, women and girls account for about two thirds of all new HIV infections. And when we think about those new infections in adolescents, about six out of seven of them are occurring in girls uh, aged 15 to 19. But also kind of the progress that was seen in our region uh, prior to COVID has really stalled. And, we, and this is in part because of the disruption of services, but also the disrupt, disruption of, of schools, uh, increases in gender-based violence. And all of this means that we need to be more attentive to our HIV program than, uh, than ever before. So why do we need prevention? And the real reason is that it's very going to be very difficult to treat our way out of the epidemic. We have are very fortunate that today many people living with HIV are on treatment and that treatment is simplified. It's basically a pill a day. Uh, and the, the options that are available to them now are have a very um, low side effect profile, making HIV a manageable condition. But it's not an insubstantial condition, particularly if you're acquiring infection when you're 15. It means that we're going to have to keep people on therapy for the duration of their lives, which uh, even assuming uh, that people, the average life expectancy is 65 years, that's an incredibly long time to provide treatment to people. And we know that um, 
treatments may fail with time. And so, you know, kind of this is really a challenge for a country such as ours, which with the largest uh, um, HIV program in the world. So rather than putting people continually onto therapy, uh, you know, kind of we have to think about, can we switch off the tap and can we actually prevent new infections? So one of the game-changing biomedical prevention interventions was really the, um, in 2011, the demonstration that pre-exposure prophylaxis, that's taking an antiretroviral prior to sex, could reduce people's risk of HIV. And since then, we've seen in 2015 that WHO included the first guidance around PrEP in, in their guidelines. And over the past um, um, seven years, we've really seen an expansion in access to oral PrEP ac across the globe, such that by quarter two of 2022, about 2.7 million people had been initiated on oral PrEP. And what you can see from that map is that most of those initiations are occurring in North America, in the United States. But when we look in Eastern Southern Africa, um, South Africa and Kenya are leading the initiations. And though that's a very promising um, sign. But I think the challenge is that if you look in the other panel, what you can see again from UNAIDS is that the the global target is 10 million people on PrEP by 2025, and we are very far away from that target and will really need to accelerate our efforts to achieve the 2025 target. And this is despite us having strong evidence now from a study in um, Kenya and Uganda, as well as from some settings in high-income countries, that um, PrEP offered in the context of universal access to antiretroviral therapy can also have a significant impact on population level HIV incidence. So this was um, work done in a number of 16 districts in these two countries. And what they showed is that by identifying people who were HIV negative and the proportion of them were th that were considered based on behavioral characteristics at higher risk, only about um, a third of the people who were at high risk initiated PrEP, but even in that context, they saw um, reductions in, in HIV incidence. So 76% lower rate of infection in women, 40% lower in men, um, really kind of giving us the first evidence on the African continent that we can expect with expanded access to PrEP to see um, substantial reductions in HIV. Now, you might ask, what? how well are we doing in South Africa? Well, at latest count, we had 600,000 initiations on PrEP, and pro so probably should be doing a lot better than we're currently doing. Now, there are the, the, the first step is really getting people started on oral PrEP, but the real goal is to get them to use PrEP during periods of risk in their lives. And one of the challenges that we have observed in a number of programs is that many people who initiate PrEP in, within sort of six months fail to persist. And this is a particular problem for um, uh, younger people uh, who are particularly young women who happen to be at higher risk for HIV. So there are a number of reasons that have been cited in the literature for why people may not persist with PrEP. You can probably group those into um, a few categories. So the first has got to do with the drug and people's concern about side effects. There are also concerns about pill size and having to take um, many pills, particularly if you are healthy. Um, and then there are a set of uh, challenges really related to the health system and health systems costs, which is just what it costs to come to clinic visits, uh, to come back repeatedly for prescriptions. Uh, and in some, in some countries where there is not uh, universal health access, just the kind of cost of, of uh, seeking care. And then there are a set of social barriers, which we've observed with PrEP, which have to do with stigma and discrimination in part because PrEP is maybe associated with uh, behaviors which are associated, which are socially stigmatized um, or with populations that are stigmatized like sex workers or men who have sex with men. Um, and then, you know, in our setting with high levels of gender-based violence, particularly for women, women may fear violence or experience violence at the hands of their partners if, uh, who may discover that they're using PrEP. 
Uh, and all of this may be complicated in the context of other social challenges like substance use or poor mental health. And all of this has really been disrupted by, by COVID. Uh, so I think the fundamental idea is that taking a pill a day is challenging for people, particularly when they have a lot else going on in their lives. And what we need are a range of PrEP options, particularly longer acting or more discrete options that could that could overcome some of the challenges with daily pill taking. So what options do we have? Well, the, the one that is, is um, closest to introduction within the health system is a drug called cabotegravir. It is an integrase um, strand uh, transfer uh, inhibitor, and um, it is an analog to dolutegravir. And in trials that were um, stopped prematurely in 2020, uh, basically cabotegravir was shown to be safe and effective as PrEP. So the trial HPTN-083 was a trial conducted in cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men. It involved participants from North and South America, as well as Asia and South Africa. Uh, and that, in that trial, the DSMB stopped the study prematurely for evidence of efficacy, where they saw a 66% reduction in HIV infections in the CAB arm compared to the TDF-FTC arm. That's the Truvada arm or the oral PrEP arm. Um, so the study that I led was HPTN-084, and that was a study in cisgender women aged 18 to 45 years. Uh, it involved just over 3,000 participants at 20 sites in seven countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And we were also prematurely unblinded by the DSMB for efficacy in November 2020, because um, CAB was shown to have an 88% um, lower risk of HIV infection compared to the TDF-FTC arm. Now, it's important to point out that in both those trials, we had really low HIV incidence rates of around um, 1%. And, you know, kind of making the case that both agents are uh, important in preventing HIV infection, it's just that cabotegravir likely has an adherence advantage, making it more effective in preventing HIV infection. Uh, so since those trials were um, unblinded in 2020, we have gone on to unblind participants and follow them up for a period while, uh, while awaiting transition really to a protocol amendment to offer open label access to cabotegravir. And what we have seen in the unblinded period, which is approximately 12 months after the initial unblinding, is the sustained effect of, of HIV prevention. Uh, in both of the trials. So the, the one-year data in HPTN-083 continued to see a risk reduction of 66%. And the majority of infections that were observed on cabotegravir tended to be associated with injection interruptions or delays where people had been off cabotegravir for a prolonged period of time. In HPTN-084, again, we saw a sustained protective effect and all of the breakthrough infections on that trial have been associated with poor or absent cabotegravir use. Um, that's not including the Truvada group. So we have not observed on injection breakthrough infections, uh, unlike the HPTN-083 trial. So cabotegravir is clearly uh, effective in preventing HIV infection, even in high-risk populations. Now, one of the interesting things that has uh, emerged as a result of these trials is really uh, a much improved understanding of sort of the virology of HIV in the context of cabotegravir. And what we've learned is that uh, these uh, drugs, which are very potent antiretrovirals, um, are highly suppressive. Um, and when used as PrEP, uh, if someone develops a breakthrough infection, what may happen is that uh, it may be difficult to diagnose the HIV infection with conventional diagnostics. And that's because CAB suppresses viral replication. And so the stimulus for antibody production is very kind of minimal. And there may be delays in antibody production, which are generally what we use to kind of um, as, our, as our rapid tests. The concern here is that you could then have a situation where you have someone who is on prolonged monotherapy, they have declining levels of cabotegravir, 
Um, and at the same time, they have an emergent HIV infection. And in the context of monotherapy, that could lead to insti resistance. So that has been seen in a couple of uh, a few cases in the HPTN 083 trial. Uh, what has been important to note is that resistance can be overcome by non insti heart regimens. And one of the questions is if we add a sensitive HR, HIV RNA assay, maybe we may we be able to detect infection early and therefore initiate treatment early. And that's an important question because it's obviously not a viable strategy in many parts of the world, but it is part of the initial requirements of the FDA labeling. So this is a question we're exploring in the ongoing uh, open label extensions. So one of the other things to think about cabotegravir is just who's going to use it in the future. And one of the um, uh, important um, Oh, one of the important issues that arose during the cabotegravir trial was the issue of concern about neural tube defects in women who were using dolutegravir for treatment around the time of periconception. This was data that came uh, was emerged from Botswana, and you know, kind of in 2018, and caused a lot of anxiety globally uh, in treatment programs. Subsequently, that signal has been shown to ha have been likely due to chance and no different than other uh, antiretrovirals that are used for treatment, but it caused a great deal of anxiety at the time. What that meant is that we basically had to require all participants in the HPCN 084 study to use long-acting reversible contraception, which meant that, and to stop uh, people using um, uh, study product or investigational product at the point at which they were confirmed pregnant, which means we have no data on the safety of cabotegravir in pregnancy. Um, and yet what we know, and this, this graph really shows that from the um, comparing the blinded to the unblinded period, we saw an increase in pregnancy incidence in both arms of the study. And that tells us really that women, once they knew that they were using an effective PrEP agent, really wished to conceive safely without fear of HIV infection. And this is why it's going to be important for us to have data on the safety of cabotegravir in pregnant and breastfeeding women so that uh, as cabotegravir gets introduced into programs, we know that women are not excluded from the benefits of cabotegravir and actually can receive HIV protection without concern for their pregnancy. So some promising data that we already have comes from the blinded period of the trial where we looked at the um, um, adverse events reported during pregnancy, as well as the, the pharmacokinetics during pregnancy. Now, these people all stopped their injections at the time um, at the time that their pregnancy was first detected. But because this is a long-acting drug, you know, kind of you can stop the injections, but you still will have drug on uh, uh, in detectable in plasma for a prolonged period of time. So what we saw was that there were no congenital anomalies, which is somewhat reassuring, but also that residual CAB levels were generally well tolerated during pregnancy. So we didn't see increased reports of nausea or vomiting, which might be common side effects with antiretrovirals uh, and kind of compound their symptoms of pregnancy. And also what we saw was that the uh, drug decay curves were very similar to non-pregnant women. So that kind of gives us a hint that the metabolism is likely to be similar in the two groups, and this would mean that we don't have to do dose adjustments, but this is work that we are continuing to explore in the open label extensions. So keeping in the theme of not leaving people behind, one of the other important groups who is at incredibly high risk for HIV infection um, are um, people who are taking gender-affirming hormone therapy um, and in the case of the HPTN 083 study, they include a population. They included a population of transgender women, who were taking um, uh, estrogen-based uh, hormone therapy um, as part of gender-affirming hormone therapy. And so, this drug-drug interaction is an important interaction to um, exclude. And what they found was that the this graph really reflects that the cabotegravir concentrations in people on 
gender affirming hor hormone therapy versus not were very similar. So there's no indication of a drug drug interaction, which will be very reassuring for people who want to use cabotegravir in the context of gender affirming hormone therapy. So I've hinted already that these studies are still ongoing. They were unblinded in 2020. We have had a, a period of transition and now we're in a period known as the open label extensions. And the principle behind the open label extension is that people who participated in a, in a randomized trial didn't have a choice of which arm they were allocated to. And when we see that one arm provides greater benefit, what we do is we offer the other arm the opportunity to join the kind of more um, the superior group. So we have now included uh, or we have now opened an amendment which allows all participants as well as participants in the adolescent sub-study to um, transition to open label cabotegravir if they wish. And I can say that three quarters of the study population are now on cabotegravir. So clearly um, it's a preferred product for many people. Uh, one of the things that we did was we no longer require an oral lead-in. That was something that was required in the trials. Uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we are evaluating the value of RNA testing as part of a testing algorithm. And we will, in this phase of the study, allow women who are pregnant, if they consent, to continue receiving injections through pregnancy so we can collect additional data on the safety and pharmacology of cabotegravir in pregnancy and lactation and learn about really whether there is a need for dose adjustment, but also learn about cabotegravir concentrations in breast milk, which is virtually unknown. Uh, there are a number of other activities which are really supporting implementation. I won't go into them into too much detail, except to say that we're really interested in whether we can extend the, the effects of cabotegravir in women to accommodate a quarterly interval dosing, so we combine this with contraception. And then there are a number of activities really focused on better understanding um, diagnostics and also what the drug correlates of protection are. So I think the, the big thing is when we, when we have a product like this, which is shown to have such a huge impact on HIV infection, the big questions are when are we getting it and, you know, kind of can we get it now? And just to say that this is um, obviously been a huge topic for conversation uh, in the last two years and particularly this year. And one of the key questions is really, what is the price? Um, so there are two cost effectiveness analyses which have really pointed out that cabotegravir can have significant benefit or advantage over oral Truvada, but its cost really needs to be about slightly less than two times the cost of a two-month supply of Truvada in order for it to be cost effective. And so there's an acceptable range of a cost per injection, which would be between $9 and $15. And just to say that the manufacturer has come close to that number for, um, for the scale-up period. So this tells us that kind of setting these threshold prices can be very helpful for starting a conversation with donors, but also uh, with manufacturers, but also stimulating donors and the conversation about access. So in terms of what happens next and when will we get cabotegravir within our health system, there are a couple of key next steps. So we know that the um, dossier is being reviewed by the uh, SAPRA, the regulatory authority. We also know that the essential medicines list has made a provisional recommendation on the value of adding cabotegravir to the essential medicines list. But there are also a number of key questions for how you actually deliver this at scale. And doing things in a trial is the first um, point, but really doesn't tell us how things might be done in, in real life in the context of our messy health system. So there are a number of questions that implementation science projects can answer. Uh, including what are, how do we deliver to particular populations? What should those models of delivery be? And also very importantly, uh, what we've not had to do before is really offer people choice of an HIV prevention method. And if we think about how, um, for example, contraception is offered, it's not offered optimally where people necessarily get to choose 
something that works for them. So thinking about this for HIV prevention is going to be important. Uh, so to that end, there are a number of uh, implementation science projects that are planned, which are likely to take off in the next year, a number of them in South Africa. And this will provide the Department of Health with really important information about what the delivery considerations are for this for this new agent. So it's a really exciting time. And, you know, kind of it's, it's really amazing to see uh, a, a, a positive result uh, in HIV prevention, which has the potential really to have a significant impact on the epidemic. So what about the other options that lie ahead, just in case you hear about some of these uh, during the course of your career? Well, you may have heard about the Depivirine vaginal ring. It's a, a silicon ring that essentially contains uh, reservoirs of Depivirine um, and the idea is that this ring can be inserted monthly and retained for a month at a time because um, the drug leaches out into the, um, uh, around the cervix. It has low systemic absorption and that's considered an advantage for some. Uh, and it's really considered acceptable and hasn't interfered with sex. There were two trials which showed a placebo controlled trial, which showed a 30% reduction in HIV risk compared to placebo. Uh, and open label extension sh studies showed uh, greater risk reduction based on counterfactual modeling. Now, the difference between this and the previous trial that I talked about is that these were placebo controlled trials and not compared to oral TDFFTC. So since those trials, there has been progress to get a favorable opinion from the EMA. And WHO included recommendations around the ring, uh, sorry, the, the last year. And there were su regulatory submissions in a number of countries, including South Africa. SAPRA approved the ring, but unfortunately the uh, NEMLAC or the Essential Medicines List Committee did not recommend the ring for use in part because there was very limited data on efficacy compared to Truvada. And there have been anxieties that this may not be a product that is as effective as, um, as either cabotegravir or oral prep. And so there are concerns about recommending it as a sort of additional choice. So I do think there's gonna to need to be additional work to kind of understand the demand and, and potentially the, the, the niche that might benefit from this product. But it's, a, it's an important lesson that you can get very far along the road and still not have products implemented within the health system. And in part, the biggest barrier to implementation has been the cost of the ring. Uh, it's kind of marked as somewhere between 15 and $12 a ring. So what's on the horizon? Well, there is a new antiretroviral which is under development by Gilead. It's called lenacapavir. And it's basically um, a, a drug that works by inhibiting capsid disassembly, nuclear transport and assembly. Um, it is highly potent at very low concentrations, which makes it ideal for a long acting product because you can give a small amount, but it can last for a long period of time. And the initial uh, pharmacology work suggested that this could be given every six months. So this makes you think that you could give sort of two injections a year, which would be ideal potentially. So the trial started in, I think, 2020, but then were put on hold by the FDA. They've now relaunched. The, the, tri the trial in South Africa includes women and will evaluate lenacapavir, but also FTAF, which is very similar to TDFFTC, because the earlier FTAF trials didn't include women. So this is something that we'll likely hear more about in the coming years. But many of the challenges that are outlined with cabotegravir may also apply to lenacapavir in terms of things like HIV diagnostics, just because of this really long uh, pharmacokinetic um, tail. Okay, so another drug that's been in the news is really is Latrivia. This was billed as a drug that had a great safety profile and could be given as a monthly pill. It was developed both for treatment and prevention. So in prevention, it was developed as a monthly pill with a view to kind of developing it as a subdermal implant, which could be implanted once a year and could in the future potentially be combined with the contraceptive. 
and the um, that we went through the phase two trials, initiated the phase three trials, and then the FDA put uh, the the trial on a clinical hold. And recently, um, Merck announced that they would continue the program for for pr uh, treatment, but not for prevention. So this is what uh, this is why we do trials because we learn about how these products work in, in the people who might use them. And the safety signal or the reason they were put on hold is for a safety signal linked to um, effects on lymphocytes and, um, and lymphopenia over time. Now, these were not necessarily clinically significant, but the concern is in a healthy population, you don't want these sorts of side effects, particularly if the risk if it's a greater risk for people who might be at risk for HIV infection. So that product is now not going forward for prevention, but there may be future products. All right, um, I thought I would tell you a couple of things about broadly neutralizing antibodies. The idea around broadly neutralizing antibodies is that there are antibodies that are developed or identified in people who have chronic HIV infection, but who mount an immune response. And that those antibodies uh, either have high potency or, or breadth, so they're able to neutralize a number of HIV viruses. And that graph really kind of gives you the array of, um, of, of broadly neutralizing antibodies, and they're kind of being identified all the time. Uh, so what you really want is a is a, a product that is kind of up in the top right uh, is it right hand corner so high potency and high breadth. I'm going to tell you about this uh, uh, BNAB we call them or broadly neutralizing antibody called VRCO1. Uh, VRCO1 was evaluated in a large trial uh, in many countries, including in South Africa, and. The study didn't see any overall impact on HIV infection. It looked at two dosing groups versus placebo, and there was no difference between the three groups. But it was still an important study because it was a proof of concept study that basically uh, allowed investigators to understand that VRC CO1 did prevent some HIV infections, but only in the strains of HIV that were susceptible to CR VRC CO1 which only occurred in about 30% of the population. And when the study was originally designed, there was a view that there would be much, many more susceptible viruses. So this is really influencing the way we think about investigating these products going, going forward. So I give you some of these examples just to, to say that, you know, kind of success is not final. And in fact, in my lifetime in HIV prevention, I've probably seen more failures, but, um, Failure is also not fatal. It teaches us something. And it's really kind of the courage to keep on going that counts, <clears throat> to paraphrase Winston Churchill. So, you know, kind of in the field of HIV prevention, we've had many setbacks, but also a number of successes which really have the potential uh, to have an impact on the epidemic. And so what does the future hold? Well, we, we hope also that uh, in the not too distant future, we may be able to take some of these products that I've talked about, like rings or injections or even pills, and combine them with contraception so that we could have multi-purpose products that could be used for, for both <coughs> HIV and pregnancy prevention. So for example, in, in with respect to cabotegravir, there are already plans to evaluate a product that would combine with levonorgestrel, a contraceptive, uh, and to develop that further. And with respect to um, pills, there is already uh, there are two trials that are looking at either a combined contraceptive Truvada pill that's or one that's the the pills are separate but they're they're kind of wrapped together as a single pill. So so these are some of the things to look forward to. So in summary, I think it's important to remember that amidst many of these other pandemics. HIV is one of the oldest, and it still remains a threat to public health, particularly amongst the most vulnerable. PrEP has the real potential to reduce HIV incidence at a population level. And although we've seen good progress with expanding access to oral PrEP, we really need to focus on persistence during periods of risk if we're going to see these impacts on incidence. 
So we hope that these new long acting agents can overcome some of the persistence challenges. And given the early successes of agents like Cabotegravir, we need to really focus now on making sure that the people who need these drugs the most get access to them. It's exciting that there is a pipeline of other antiretroviral based PrEP agents in development and that we can expect the trial results. Uh, and ultimately what we need in the future is a range of products that also have multi-purpose potential that could have the greatest value and impact for particularly in our region. So just want to acknowledge some of these people who've contributed to, to these presentations and to thank you very much for, for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for that super informative talk. I think it's just so interesting to hear that, you know, there are so many trials and cool things that, you know, are possibilities. Um, so, yeah, if you are, whether you're watching on YouTube or in Google Meets, please feel free to raise your hand or type a question in the chat and then Prof can address it. So I see three questions in the chat. Do you want me to dive in and start there? Sure, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So um, the first, the f there are three questions from Zuha. The first one is, have we investigated the effect of cabotegravir in animal models for possible effects during pregnancy? So the answer is yes. Uh, all all drugs that go through human testing have had some animal testing and there is a requirement to do something called the reproductive toxicology uh, evaluations early on in product development. So um, there were um, studies done in rats and basically there are no feto uh, embryo embryological um, effects observed. Uh, in extremely high doses, so outside of the range of clinical dosing, there was an observation that um, uh, rat pups may, may, there may be impacts on parturition. And in part that kind of, I think, created a sense of conservatism around the evaluation of cabotegravir in pregnancy. But from the point of view of um, uh, sort of neural tube defects, there were no, no signals of that uh, in animal studies. Um, in terms of the next question, could the residue levels found in the blood of pregnant individuals play a role in how well they responded to the drug and process of gestation? So I think, the well, I would say that during pregnancy, people no longer received injections. Uh, it's a long acting product. They did during that uh, time when they were taken off injections, uh, they received daily oral Truvada, so they would still have um, protection against HIV. So we could argue that the Truvada also provided a level of protection against, against HIV. I think the reason that we were interested in the pharmacology uh, of residual cab levels was really to understand whether the hemodynamic changes observed in pregnancy and the metabolic changes observed in pregnancy, whether they change the handling of cabotegravir, and that doesn't seem to be the case. And the reason that we're interested in that is that we want to know, do we need to change the dose in pregnancy to maybe increase the dose or decrease the do dose in pregnancy? And the, so far, the indications are that we don't, which is really uh, important to know, but ultimately we need to evaluate that. So that's what we're doing at the moment. And then the third question, um, do we know what the raw provisional data are about uh, cabotegravir and pregnancy? And the short answer is it's still early days. We um, have enrolled 40 women in the pregnancy study. And so our target is 50 for the pharmacology. So we will have probably some data early next year. Uh, and then we will enroll larger numbers for um, to assess a, a safety outcomes. So that will take a little bit longer. OK. 
how how is cabotegravir given? Great question. I should have been more clear about that. So cabotegravir is given as an intramuscular injection in the buttocks. It's a three mil injection, uh, and it's given in the buttocks. Every if uh, the 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 initiation schedule requires you to give two injections four weeks apart, and after that, injections are given every eight weeks. And uh, in terms of whether or not injections are acceptable, the injection side reactions are usually mild to moderate and primarily pain associated with the first injection. But after that, people don't experience much pain or discomfort. So, and in the trial, we observed about a frequency of injection site reactions of about three out of 10 people with the first injection, but there were no discontinuations due to injections. Shall I just keep going? <laughs> so the next questions are, do you think it will be possible to reach 10 million people on PrEP by 2025? Um, I think that it's good to have global goals. I think that we need to be reminded that, you know, I think that that um, when I was a medical student, you know, kind of HIV was a death sentence and we used to send people home to die with no way of giving them any uh, any prospect of recovery. Uh, and we, w we saw many terrible opportunistic infections. So I remember those days and kind of am grateful that we have now uh, medications that make HIV a manageable condition. But I don't think we should treat HIV and its impacts on health and the health system lightly. So I think we should do what we can to create demand for PrEP and for prevention and sort of aspire to reach that, that global target. What is my opinion on the higher burden of HIV illness and death in South Africa? Is there hope? Will we ever be able to adequately control it? Well, um, my personal opinion is that when I look at where we've come from, I didn't in my lifetime think that I would be involved in a trial where we would have an agent that could reduce HIV incidence so significantly. So I do have hope. I think the important thing is that we have to make our health system work and that's no easy task. So kind of our job at this point, I think, is to kind of make sure that PrEP access is widespread, that people know about PrEP, that they, the people who need it can get access to it and that we kind of build a culture of prevention rather than sort of focusing just on, on, on treatment. Um, okay, and here's another question. This is a slightly off topic question. How can we as students or healthcare workers be more involved in aiding the prevention of HIV or even be involved in the research? And I think that's a great question. And I think that if nothing else, you know, kind of you have an opportunity to be advocates um, with your peers on campus and stimulate demand for PrEP. One of the, I think, the failed projects of PrEP was really low demand for, for oral, we, you know, kind of the, the early programs before they were sort of introduced into district clinics was to uh, introduce onto campuses and there was very low uptake in part because I think there was low demand. So I think even having conversations with with peers and creating demand about the, the fact that there is ongoing risk for an, an age group, which happens to be on campus, so people age 15 to 24, and talking about PrEP and normalizing HIV prevention and making it something that's not stigmatized but demanded are things that, that can be done. And I think the same can be done in, in clinics to, to be an advocate to ask about where PrEP is delivered What's interesting is that the many doctors who join our team to kind of participate in this research, they just say kind of how often they've worked in, you know, kind of in the hospitals or the wards and, you know, kind of felt that they wished that some of the people who have HIV had been, had had early interventions with PrEP, but often it's kind of inaccessible to doctors. So I think thinking about how how to make it accessible within your programs, but also on campuses is an opportunity. And then I think if you're interested in doing research, 
I would welcome anyone who's sort of interested in learning more about what we do at Vitsari Jai to reach out because we're happy to do student projects and create placements and really, you know, kind of feel like the work that we do is really exciting. So I love talking to people about it. Um, and, you know, kind of, I think, I didn't imagine that this is how I would, um, how I would spend my medical career, but it's been incredibly fulfilling. So, you know, kind of just would encourage you to kind of explore the opportunities that are available within within the WITS Institutes to, 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 to engage in some of this work if you're interested in it. And then the last question, again, a great a grounding question is, what is an oral lead-in? And I'm really glad you asked that question because I didn't really have a chance to explain it, but the idea with the trials, um, both for treatment and prevention, was that if we're giving an injection and that injection stays in the body for a long time, or that drug stays in the body for a long time, if you have a hypersensitivity reaction, it's difficult to take out. So the idea in the trials as a safety measure was if we give everyone oral cabotegravir for four weeks, that should be enough time to detect the majority of hypersensitivity reactions and therefore not give people an injection if they had some uh, tolerability issues. As it turns out, we really didn't see very many kind of adverse reactions or hypersensitivity reactions. And so on the balance of the data that's available now, there is a view that you can go straight to injection. And again, I would say that that's the preference for most people. They don't, if they, if they wanted oral pills, they would take oral Truvada, but in real life, people want to go straight to injection. So that's what we're doing in the open label extension. So thank you very much for all those great questions. Um, happy to answer more, but also feel free to um, to reach out to me or others at Vitsari Chai if you're interested in the work that we're doing and learning more about it, because we're more than happy to find ways to engage with students. There's just um, one question on the YouTube page. Um, well, somebody said, I cannot describe the appreciation I have for you referring to gender affirming hormone therapy and specifically addressing this vulnerable and often overlooked group. Thank you. Um, and then one question said, um, hi, doctor. Thank you so much for this incredible talk with a lot of exclamation marks. Um, would you be willing to share your email address so that we may contact you regarding any further questions? Sure. I'd be happy to. And I think you awesome. have my email yeah. address, yeah. Um, maybe Zoa can just type your email address in the chat for anybody who does have any more questions. Um, but yeah, if there is no more questions, thank you so, so much um, for, yeah, just a really informative talk. I think everyone here really enjoyed it. So thank you. Great. Thanks very much for inviting me. And um Take care, everyone, and good luck with your studies and the exams, which seem to be approaching. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.